Okay, we are now recording. And you are all muted, except for me. Thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody, to this meeting of the Bloch uh, Study Group. We're delighted to have Josh Friedlander, who will be reporting on his research into the Violin Concerto by Ernest Bloch. Uh, Joshua graduated from Florida State University with a doctorate in music uh, on this very topic. And he's currently the music director of the Pacific Northwest Chamber Orchestra as adjunct professor at Centralia College and is the strings teacher for the Centralia School District. For those of you who don't know American uh, geography, he has gone from the extreme uh, southeast of the country to the extreme northwest of the country. So covering lots of ground, covering many conceptual uh, areas as well. Please, a warm welcome for Josh Friedlander. Hello. So I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation, then we'll probably listen to some uh, excerpts of Ernest Bloch. So let me see if I can share the screen here. Okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to be, uh, let's see if I can get this myself here. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going, to get, I'm going to call this an Ernest Bloch and Native American Musical Journey, which is basically um, mostly the, the violin concerto, but I will talk about one other one right prior to it as well. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, the first time I ever listened to Bloch was probably when I was starting Manus College of Music in the 90s, and uh, I heard uh, Anna Malkin the daughter of Isaac Malkin, which I think teaches at Mahan School of Music, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, but I know Isaac Malkin at the time was. Um, she played in Medic Mount School for Strange, which is up in Westport, New York, uh, Block of Nagoon. And I, it really uh, intrigued me because I'm Jewish and I, I you know, I went to the Shul Synagogue all the time. And, and, and the, the music really um, it impressed me. It was like, wow, this is really incredible music being, you know, sounding very Judaic to what I, to what I've, I've known when I used to go to uh, synagogue. Um, then, um, ironically, my senior year, uh, Sally Thomas and, and Setzer, which were my two uh, teachers at Manus, um, asked me to play for my senior jury, Nigun. And so I did that and I got even more interested of it. So um, one thing that did, did happen when I was in, um, Man is, is that I, I used to work at Tower Records and I saw that the Heifetz collection came about, which I loved to death. And I, I always look at, um, you know, the discography and what he did with Bloch. And I noticed that he did a Nigun, Sonata number one, Sonata number two, Poem Mystique. Well, the Poem Mystique was a perfect uh, uh, minute. Um, first of all, I like the Poem Mystique for a, a, for a, um, a lecture recital because our lecture recital in Florida State was about 45 minutes long. This was about 22, 23 minutes, so it was gonna be perfect, um, uh, the, middle, the middle round. But I was really intrigued by the, the chant that was in the middle of the poem mystique. Um, so, um, so then I gave my lecture recital on the poem mystique and then, then I thought, well, you know, this is a very interesting thing. I've only known Bloch uh, doing Judaic inspired works. Did he do anything like a violin concerto? And then, uh, obviously, yes, there was. There was a violin concerto that I that caught. So then that became my, 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 my dissertation treatise. So when I did my my research, I looked at a lot of books, articles, journals, CDs, digital recordings, and photos of Bloch, uh, about Bloch. Um, I had I talked to two two Native American music experts. Uh, one was Dr. Tara C. Browner, University of California, Los Angeles. She is an ethnomusicologist in the American Indian Studies. Um, and then also the same, same title pretty much, uh, Dr. John Carlos Perea, San Francisco State University. Um, that was the first one I knew. And then after all the, the, the sources that he gave me, got me to Dr. Tara Brown, which was very interesting. I also uh, had interviews with three living, oh, once living grandchildren of Ernest Bloch. Ernest Bloch, the second one, he was alive. I did give him, uh, I had an interview with him. Uh, George Dimitrov, which is actually lives very close to me. He lives about five miles away from me in Tumwater, Washington. And Sita Milchev and Lucian Allen, who are right here today. Uh, and Lucian Allen uh, was so kind to give me a lot of uh, uh, research on, on, on the things that are happening in Lucian Bloch's diary, which is, thank you very much. 
Um, also, Letters of Ernest Block, which is at the Jean Grey Hargrove Music Library at University of California, Berkeley. There's a whole bunch there. And it took a while just to go through all of them, see if there's any that, that can help me uh, for my research. And then finally, this one last one, which I'll explain a little bit later, the recordings of Autry Archive in Braun Museum in Los Angeles. So if you did not know, um, as you know, I said Native American. So there are two other European composers that came to the United States, or, or actually not came to the United States, but uh, either visited the United States or, or wrote about um, in this time period. Um, one was Dvorak, um, the Indian canzonetta from the second movement of the Sonata, uh, Op Sonatina Opus 100 uh, in G major. It's also called Indian Lament. Um, the interesting part about this is that um, a lot, the things that he did um, was based on his two experiences of Buffalo Bill Wild West show and the Kickapoo Chief Bing, Big Moon Band and his traveling medicine show. But they were very, very short uh, instances. And ironically, the, the, the band was more multi-tribal, so it wasn't really specific to a tribe. Uh, Busoni, uh, Ferruccio Busoni, uh, did uh, take from uh, three tribal songs, which she, she received from Natalie Cur Curtis, which was an ethnomusicologist, when she sent the three tribal songs to him, and then he wrote three pieces for um, that were inspired by Native, uh, Native American music. So those are only two that 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 puts this in the blocks uh, uh, company, which is very cool. <clears throat> but the thing that's really cool for me is. Um, which the other ones do not, is that um, in, the, in, his, in, in his piece called The Blocks America, which is the first one that we see any type of uh, Native American influence by Block, um, he uh, begins using the song called Pueblo Indian Song, which is cited right on the bottom of the, the score, uh, cited to New Mexico. And both my ethnomusicologist, uh, the, um, both American Indian study people were I'm really shocked about it. In fact, Dr. Perea said this was like doing a tip of a hat saying that, you know, we got you. Uh, um, that he was trying to um, find uh, sources to see if he could find anything that is um, what he thought was uh, real or, or that was of, of not stereotypical, but really try to do reference it um, to the best of his abilities. So, and the other two that he did was Mandan and Datsa music and Chippewa music, which are also under the score. In fact, in the Chippewa music, he even gives page numbers eight to 22 on in rehearsal number five. Now, this picture here is the person who he um, cited to because he was looking for authentic music. Um, and, the, and I'll explain why he didn't do from New Mexico in a second, but um, this is Francis Densmore. And Francis Densmore is a, one of the big, huge ones of that time period who uh, went to all these Native American um, um, uh, tribes and he, she tried to uh, take the music and, and try to put it into our note system. Um, the, the reason why this happened is that in, in, um, it, there was a Dawes Act in 1878 uh, or 1887, I forgot which way it goes, but the, uh, the Dogs Act was something that inspired a lot of, of uh, composers, American composers at the time, to try to assimilate as much Native American music and also African American music if, if, if they can, so that it would not be lost in, uh, in future, in future lives, lives, lives uh, in future times because um, they were concerned about the assimilation of Native Americans to the Americans, so they would lose all their culture. So they tried to assimilate a lot of this. And Francis Densmore was one of, was this this person that went all across the United States, and um, the natives uh, really uh, uh, took it seriously. That's why they um, would be in all in their garments, and they didn't know much about what was happening, but they knew it was very important. She would use a pitch pipe. And the pitch pipe would, would, would give him the, um, the stance of where um, the sound, uh, the, the pitch they needed to start at, and then she would uh, record it on this. So um, the other things um, is that um, the completion of the Block America was, was really for a uh, competition. 
um, which he actually won. Um, the um, the pro the announcement to it happened on December 12, 1925, and he completed it on February 22nd, 1827. With uh, um, I think a week late, uh, a couple days later, I think it was the 27th, where he wrote the notes right in the beginning. Um, it was conducted by five conductors around the United States, very famous ones. And but the question I always had, even with this, why those three tribes? Why did he pick the Pueblo, the Mandandasa, and the Chippewa? Why those three? Could he be using those same in the violin control? And so, as you can see with Francis Densmore, the reason why I say that is that when you look at all these books, he's only picking two. <laughs> so there is a numerous amount of Francis Densmore Native American music books that were where she were, uh, tried to um, uh, record and then uh, and then write it down and 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 wrote wrote books of it. She also wrote books about their culture as well. So she's. She's a very, very uh, interesting lady. Other thing that's very interesting, the time period. It was completed in 1938, the, the blocks by However, if you look at this, and um, I, I got this from knowing what Gil Shacham did just recently, uh, a couple of years ago, where he did, uh, he talked about the golden age of 1930s and he made a, a, a recordings of all of them. Ironically, he missed the two Jewish ones, but when I looked at it, I said, wow, there's a lot of really big ones here. We've got Igor Stravinsky, Arnold Schoenberg, Simonovsky, you probably don't know, but it's a really good piece. I mean, I even have Heifetz recording of it. Sergei Prokofiev's second violin concerto, Bella Bartok's second violin concerto, Albert Berg, William Walton, Samuel Barber's play a lot now, Benjamin Brinton's coming up, and same with Paul Hindemith. But ironically, Ernest Bloch's is kind of getting you know, loss in all this. And I, I was, this is where it came to me. It's like, you know, I, I really want to do the, the dissertation to make sure that he, his, this, 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 mu this music can be recognized and say, hey, there's this really, really good violin show in the 30s that nobody's really playing. So um, the, what I, what I know from the sources, from what I, what I got from the CD notes and Kushner uh, book, just from the beginning, that it was derived from main mel melodic gestures using Native American sounding motives. It's the, um, then I also looked at the uh, program notes where it says started in San, San Francisco in 1930, not 1938. So really, uh, he wrote it before he even went into Europe. The introduction of the first movement was composed in Paris in 1935. This is also from the premier program notes. Um, he also wrote a whole bunch of other uh, uh, pieces, the, the Piano Sonata, Evocations, um, uh, the Avada Kodesh, the Visions and Prophecies and the Voices of Wilderness during this time period. Um, <coughs> um, he completed in Haute Savoy, I can't say this, I'm, I'm so, so bad at my, my, my language here, but he, he, he finished in the French Alps in 1938. Now, if you probably don't know, he also wrote an unpublished violin concerto, which was written um, but, well, it was written, it was, it, it's, it's dated 1899, but it was revised from this poem concertante from 1898. The, um, the person who he dedicated the, the um, violin concerto to was Joseph Segetti, a very a prominent violinist in the, in the 1900s. So this is what, um, in the premier uh, 1938 um, program notes, the, this quote is very, very interesting. This is what really caught my eye was the opening and principal subject is undoubtedly of an American Indian character and was conceived in San Francisco in 1930. It was probably influenced the, at, in the atmosphere of at least the first two movements. So that gave me something to really look at. Uh, in the um, program notes, he included musical examples that, that um, explain that. And I do have that if you need to see it, I could post it on screen uh, later. Um, Susan Block's prepared notes also kind of confirmed what this, what her father said too. So that was very interesting. And also some of the program notes that we have, I have the um, Segetti's uh, program notes and the uh, Menuhin's because those are the two bilingual I, I, I own. The one I love better playing wise is the Menuhin. I really like how Menuhin does it. So Thanks to Sita and, and Lucian here. Um, when we were doing our, our, our uh, uh, when I was doing uh, my uh, interview with them, they um, showed me a whole bunch of photographs. And what I've noticed is that these three 
Native Americans uh, tribes are things that he actually experienced. So um, the one that um, we uh, find out the first is the um, the Sioux tribe that he found that he went in the Pine uh, from the Pine Ridge Reservation of South Dakota. This was in Colorado Springs, and he wrote he did a whole he did a couple of photos on that. Now, the, the, my thoughts about why Block may have gone into this Native American um, thing was there was something called an Indian craze in the night in the, around the 1920s, 1930s, where it was being promoted by the United States government. Um, so there were a lot of they, they were trying to um, promote more of the economy. So they used tourism as a way to to uplift the economy. So this became a real um, uh, way of, of, of trying to make more money for people in really dire times. And here's the pictures I have of it, some of them that was provided by, by, by uh, Luciano and Sita Milchev. Um, and this is the tribe that we were seeing. So the Mandana Datsa, and I'll explain in a second, um, is very similar to what we call Lakota, which happens in the Dakotas. Um, and they have a certain style of music that I'll explain in a set. But the, all music that is that Dr. Browner told me was based on um, their dances. So this is something that that Bloch would have experienced. In um, I, I put it around early August 1924, and I'll explain that in a second. It's not really it's unknown exactly to to, to really you know, you know pigeonhole where this might have been, but. If he was in, in vacation between August and September of 1924, I would assume it would be somewhere around there. Um, and then we get the, the Ojibwa. The Ojibwa, there's two, the two that are really had, he had the major um, times was the Ojibwa and the Pueblo. So Bloch, um, um, this picture has Suzanne on the left, um, uh, Bloch and Lucien on the right, I believe. And the, the times that they were there were August 11th to September 24th, 1924. And I'll explain this thing about Susie Block became quite crazy over Charlie Potts. This was written by Lucian Allen in her diary, um, which she had a relationship until 1931. And who is Charlie Potts? Well, he was a chief of the Ontario Ojibwa tribe. So right there, there's a little bit of inspiration where he's, he's doing six weeks going back and forth from, from this lake. Um, apparently, I think one side of the lake, if I recall, was uh, the, the, the tribe. And then the other side was you know, the vacationing motels and stuff that were not part of the tribe. So they, would, they went back and forth on that, if I recall. Um, and so Temagami, Ontario, I'm not sure exactly if he was doing, doing them by car or by train going up from where he lived. but. That's the first one. I'm oh, sorry, the second one. The third one was, um, and this is where I, I think I caught somewhere as well, where somebody said that it was influenced by Stieglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe uh, to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ironically, uh, when Lucian uh, Allen sent me something was very interesting that on June 23rd 20, of 1924, uh, Lucian Block received a package from her father in Santa Fe. So he was not only there one time, he was there prior to it. The question is when, that's the big question. I, I, I assume it might be between May 23rd and, and June 19th, looking at all his, the timelines that may or may not happen, but it's who knows, it's really hard to tell on that. Uh, the only thing is, is that um, if you know anything about Santa Fe, Santa Fe doesn't really have an international airport. So it's very, I mean, he would have to take a couple of days to get there. I'm assuming that um, unless they had some uh, a, a landing landing strip, I don't think he would be there in, in just in and out really quickly. He would be there for a little a couple of days. That's my opinion. But uh, that um, but this was very interesting when I saw this, and then I saw these photos of of him taking pictures of Pueblo Indian woman in, in New Mexico in 1924. This was really uh, interesting, being on a, a, on a possible tribal location. So I was very intrigued about this. And this is one thing that was really cool about Block is that he, um, other than the other ones where they're, you know, Dvorak uh, kind of um, 
was uh, just taking like maybe one skip it about like an hour say okay you know dance something for me and then I I will I will check it out and so forth or you know, Busoni was getting things from from her um, from one of her um, students Block was experiencing these things Block was uh, trying to create something of an authentic uh, um, experience about uh, of, of, of Native American music which made me so intrigued about uh, why he uh, possibly did it for his violin control. Other things I wanted to show, which is very interesting, again, back to this Indian craze. Um, he, one of these pictures says, uh, the Museum of Indian and Navajo, Chimayo, Baleta, blankets, and Mexican handcraft. This is, the, the, you would, he would have seen these all over the place. And uh, obviously he's taking a picture of it because he's, he's inspired by uh, native culture. Um, and of course, he, he seemed like he loved the Santa Fe as well. So, um, and he was there for, for a good two months, you know, writing not only this, but writing a whole bunch of other pieces as well. Another thing was really, I think he would have been intrigued by is the, is the uh, church there, the St. Francis Assisi Church. This picture on the right-hand side is a picture of Block, right, uh, you know, showing partial insides of, of the, it's, it's across the street, I recall. But I was there in Santa Fe. But the really cool part is the actual church. And I think, and this is another thing where I come with the poem Mystique and, and why he used chant and such in, in it. The yud hey vav hey on the top of, of, of the uh, entrance. That would really caught his eye. Um, the thing that's really interesting about uh, Santa Fe is this history about you know, Jewish merchants, six of them, uh, six families that, that were, um, that developed the modern day Santa Fe that we see today. Um, they were all Jewish. And um, the person who gave money to uh, this church was a Jew named Spiegelberg. Um, and he had a very good, um, uh, a very good um, uh, relationship with the archbishop, which is Archbishop Lamy. And um, yes, there was church here beforehand since the 1500s, but this is the modern day one that we've seen from the late 1800s all the way to today. But I can I can assure you that the block would not have not missed this part here. Um, this is this this is a very intriguing thing with you at Hey and I think that's and that's the that's the word of God. So um, that was a that was to dedicate the Jews who actually gave money. One of the things very interesting of Santa Fe, New Mexico, is that um, he would have been very interested in the multilinguistic part of, of Santa Fe. Santa Fe, um, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, you had um, to be, the, the natives like people who were multilinguistic. Uh, and, and, and this was a very big trade area at the, at the time. And so um, that was very, uh, the European Jews really um, were enticed by the, the multilinguistic parts. And that's why a lot of the families came, came to Santa Fe, obviously not only be around, but also they can do a lot of uh, commerce uh, very easily. Um, but it felt more like what they were used to in Europe. That's what um, the history of New Mexico explained to me on, on this book I was reading. Um, yeah, so let's get to the, the big part. So let's talk about the music itself. So when I talked to Dr. Tara Browner, um, she um, recognized that, you know, because I did not know anything about Native American music. And even when I, you know, you read the, the Densmore books, uh, you, you get a little bit of it, but you really don't know exactly, you need an expert to explain this a little bit to me. So the, um, the way that this is contour, um, you know, it, it's not what Pueblo, but it might have been Ojibwa white. Now Ojibwa is the same name as Chippewa. So it's, 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 it's interchangeable. So when I say Ojibwa, um, that's what they, they use today. And the Ojibwa is roughly in the Great Lakes region and the Ontario region. Of, of the United States. So what she explained to me uh, in, in this excerpt is that the terracing, the lift up was very similar to Northern plain singing. And the arc contour of this could have been influenced by the uh, by Ojibwa um, because he's attempting to, to create a five beat phrase based on the five uh, number system or recall if she said. Um, <clears throat> Dens Densmore, uh, I think what he was trying to do with, with, with Block was more the accessibility rather than trying to make it extremely authentic. Um, 
and and it says it in in the prepare notes. Uh, this this theme ends typically as do many Indian themes on a descending third and in typical symphony notation. Now, um, the notes when I know that 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 uh, minor third descending thing was of a stereotype. <laughs> Uh, that, um, but I think uh, I think Ernest Block felt that it, it might have been possible for more accessibility to a greater audience, so maybe he threw that in there, to that. Finally, the Scottish snap it's not native, so that's that's something that Block was very accustomed to, not what is in here, which is the um, we see here with um, the da da right here, very very you know we see that a lot with with Block. And the example she gave to me was the Grim Dream song. So you, I heard this big arc of of sound. Now there's also this 5B phrase that you feel through it. That's what she felt similar when she, she heard it. Now this is the second one, which is the Lakota. Lakota is similar to the Mendana and Datsa. It's described in the uh, program notes as a second subject. And this is what it shows right here. It goes from high to low melody. That's what usually what you see. So when, when you're hearing a uh, uh, Lakota-like, it goes up high, it comes down like this, and then it comes back up and it goes like this. So that's what you, you hear. So it's not like this, you get more like this. Like it's almost like he's running out of wind. So he's going really high pitches and then he will come all the way, all the way, all the way down, which is very similar to what we see here on the second subject. But the reason why I picked these is because um, there must have been a reason why he, he, he wanted to show these particular ones in his program notes. The three, four meter like block interpretation, the polymeter is in the chromaticism is very similar to what you might hear in Lakota like. And the one and the huge leaps as you see happening here, which are very, very common also with this arch going down. It happens in the second, second uh, measure as well. It's going up, up um, there's a couple of them that are happening. And now, um, the song that she used, and the reason I couldn't use them here is because it's, they're, they're, they're wax recordings, you can, you can barely hear them. The Omaha song from Big Black Bear that she showed to me, and then I listened to it. Finally, the Pueblo. Um, the Pueblo um, has a very narrow and low range. So most of them the, in the Pueblo, is, it, was, it was done by the males. And they would use gourd rattles, not a powwow a beat as, uh, right from the beginning, which is ironically, um, this sound here is so similar to what we hear in the America where the, the low strings go first and, and, and stay down there and there's no beat by the timpani. And, and both of them, if, you really, if you're really listening to it, the timpani doesn't come in until a little bit later, and then, and then it just goes, then it just goes. And that's, that happens also in the violin guitar, where after the, the, the solo comes in, after the solo, when you go to the second tutti, then you start getting the timpani coming in. So it was, it was very interesting. Obviously, the, 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 the Scottish snap uh, thing is not native. I think it's more of a, you know, for um, musical melody, I think he just, you know, it's, it's a block stamp. So my thought, and this is a conjecture, is well, why on earth will he, he decide, okay, I'm composing something in, in San Francisco in 1930. What spurred him on that idea? I mean, we're talking about six years between 1924 and 1930. And my thought is this guy named Solomon Bebo. Now, um, he, um, he might, the, 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 he was the only non-Native American to ever govern a tribe in the United States history from 1881 and 1885. And guess what? He was Jewish. And, I, and, and this was very interesting to me. He also had Bebo trading posts all over Santa Fe and New Mexico, the predominant one. Um, he was not only just uh, Bebo himself, but it was also Bebo and all of his family members, his brothers and sisters. So they, they had a good monopoly-ish way of, of trading stuff in that area, obviously because he had a lot of good uh, um, uh, relations with the Yakima Pueblos who were right on top of the mountains, um, north of them, I recall. Um, married a full-blooded Yakima Pueblo woman named uh, Joanna Vale, and they also had two sons. Um, he joined the congregation, ironically, because he went, he went to uh, um, San Francisco twice. Once he did it in the early, uh, right before the San Francisco earthquake, and he tried to make a business there, and then the earthquake happened, his business was destroyed, he went back to Santa Fe. Second time was in 1928 because he wanted his, his uh, family to have more of a Judaic 
upbringing. Um, so um, it's, it's questionable if she was ever converted. It's hard to tell because Temple Emmanuel is a reformed, reformed temple. I'm not sure exactly what they have done. They also, there was also uh, talk that the second son had a bar mitzvah there. And we know that um, their remains are in the cemetery of Temple Emmanuel, Temple Emmanuel in Colma, California, outside of San Francisco. They were cremated. Um, there's also recordings, five native songs in July 20, 1904 uh, by Bebo, Charles, by, uh, that was asked by Charles Loomis. And it's currently at Autry Archives in the Braun Museum in Los Angeles. And finally, there is a Bebo in New Mexico, which, which is the, um, which is also like the descendants of it, which is, which is on the Acoma Pueblo uh, range. This is a picture of, of Solomon Bebo. And um, so the question I always had is also, um, could he, they met in 1924? It's possible. He also, he probably knew about the, the legend of him called Moses on the Mesa. I mean, that, I mean, can you imagine a, a Jew uh, having, knowing that there was a Jew there that was governing a tribe, making treaties, made a treaty with the America, the only one that really, really did a really good job to save the environment and also uh, save it from drilling. And to this very day, those barriers are not being harmed whatsoever. So he really had an impact. However, once, uh, once he made a treaty, the Acoma Pueblos were not happy about it because it wasn't by an Acoma Pueblo. They were so fascinated by this guy because he, he spoke Yiddish and he spoke, he was multilinguistic. So he also, um, so did he might, might have met him when he was doing his uh, work with uh, uh, of the Avada Kadesh? This is another thing I was thinking. Um, again, these are all conjectures um, that um, he, I, I would say if he was going in and out of this place and seeing a person with an Akuma Pueblo woman, I would think it, it would be like, okay, what's going on here? You know, that would, that would, that would intrigue me uh, as, as many others because everybody would be Ashkenazi. <laughs> so, um, so the, um, the other things that was really interesting in, 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 the, in the music is the, the juxtaposition that I, I, I feel between the Judaic and the Native American-like ones, Judaic-like and the Native American-like. So you would have the Native American-like ones that I, that, that I explained, and then right afterwards, you would have something connected to a Judaic-like uh, song. And I'm not saying that's Judaic as in like it is Jewish, no, but I think it has, uh, if he's using it from like pieces from like Abba de Kadesh, I think he, um, He's he he he's he's kind of intertwining it. Even though in the in the notes he says, See, I don't hear anything that's that that's Judaic in this whole in this whole work, which is really interesting. Um, so um, did he hear the? I'm not sure if he heard the, the novel contour of, of of what he sung. The thing is, was very interesting when you hear Block sing is that he um, so Bebo sing is that he was he sung melodies, but they sound like somebody uh, a, a Jewish folk song type thing. It didn't sound nothing like you ever hear um, from um, from like if you, what you think of Native American music. Uh, you know, with the powwows and, and and hearing this 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 tribal melodies. No, it didn't sound like whatsoever. It sounded more like something I would hear from of uh, uh, music uh, from from Judaic culture, which is really interesting. Other thing that's really interesting is that the evocations was also uh, started in San Francisco as well. So um, uh, that was one thing that was very interesting in my work that I saw. So the well, my last slide I wanted to show was the Judaic influence on us, and uh, and and maybe I'll let you listen to a little bit of parts of. Of, of the America right at the beginning to hear what you hear, which I love, and then the violin control. But um, the the Abada Kadesh part is that you have this 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 dreidelich like um, gesture that happens right after the um, the solo, and it happens many times in the the, the violin control. So you have da 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 da. It happens all the time throughout the the entire thing, in, in all three movements, in fun, in fact. So, and the other reason I think that he might have gone to the thing is that um, one thing about the the Temple Emmanuel, uh, it used to be in a different location, um, and due to the earthquake, it had to, it, it, they had to rebuild it. So the earthquake happened in like 1907, I think, or 1908. And um, the the rebuilding of it was on top of this this hill. This is my own picture of it in 19 in 1927. And not only that, the American Institute of Architects 
selected to Temple Manuel's finest piece of architecture in Northern California. So, I mean, it's it's a real big place. It's, it holds 1,700 people, um, and I, I'm assuming that he would probably want to see what it looks like where he's where he's going to write. And not only that, I think he would probably check one of their uh, um, their prayer books. I would say just to see how uh, to. I don't know if he had one or he was using using theirs. That's that's all conjecture. So that's all I have on my my PowerPoint. What I can show um, is um, I want to show when I could have just swap is hearing a little bit. Uh, first of all, let's, let's let's do the block America because this is this is the one that I that says in in the, this this the, to know a little bit a um, little bit more of the block America is that uh, it was uh, dedicated to Walt Whitman. And Abraham, in the to said it's dedicated to the memory of Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman, whose vision has held, uh, upheld its inspiration. And it says the ideals of America are imperishable; they embody the future credo of all mankind, a union in common purpose, and underwillingly accepted guidance of widely diversified races, ultimately to become one race, strong and great. But as Walt Whitman has said, "quote to hold men together by paper and seal." or by compulsion is of no account. That only holds men together, which aggregates all in a living principle as the whole of the limbs of the body of the fibers of plants, end quote. So it's really cool. And then, then he, he, he cites right here, he, he acknowledges it's gratefully made by the composer to Francis Densmore, author of Mandan Adatsa music and Chippewa music. And then gives gives the citation very nicely over here. So, and he gets some other citations for other things, but I'm not going to get into that for other parts. So one thing that's kind of interesting I love about the beginning of this, the Ernest Block America is very similar to what we hear in Mahler 1, where he's using harmonics, uh, but though it's, it's, a, it's a fifth, he's using that open fifth, but it gives that really nice texture. And then all of a sudden you hear the, the uh, cellos, the, the, the lower strings come in. This is this, this is, uh, the Stokowski one. I could go on and on because if I go on and on, it, it, later he goes into the Manadadatsa and the Chippewa. So this, I just wanted to give the feeling of the beginning. So I just, I just love that beginning. It's just, it's so cool. Um, but the, now comes the the violin concerto. At the beginning of the violin concerto, I talk about the Ojibwe like uh, melody that he conceived in San Francisco, um, and then he wrote the the, the beginning in 1935. Uh, or actually conceived in 19, but wrote it more in 1935. My apologies. This is the uh, menu in my fellow.
and there's the symphony going. You hear it right there. And here's that Abed uh, Kadesh like sit on. So that, that was one part. The other one I want to show the second subject, which is uh, 632. So you can hear how this one sounds. And also the open strings, which also kind of gives us that really good character. OK, right there. So that, those are the ones I could go on and on and on, but I could, you know, we, we could be here all day. But uh, yeah, so that's all I have. Um, if there's any questions, please, you know, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Joshua. Really, um, kind of a mind-bending presentation in uh, some ways. Um, in that it brings together so many different strands of musical influence, so many different historical uh, pieces of this. Um, I'm wondering if I could just start with a question of my own and then, of course, we'll open it up to other comments and questions. I was glad to hear you mention Dvorak as one earlier example of how this idea of making use of Native American musical traditions, incorporating them into your original works, has a history. And uh, there was this period when Antonin Dvorak lived in the United States for several years in the 1890s, traveled around, heard Native American music, and heard various expressions of African American music, both in New York and elsewhere, and wrote this very famous article for a magazine which uh, still exists, Harper's, uh, in which he basically stressed the, uh, the case that this is what American composers needed to do. That in the same way that he, Dvorak, built up uh, a kind of Czech national tradition in symphonic music by drawing on Bohemian folk tunes and so on, that is what composers ought to do in the United States, by drawing on the, the musical influences in their country. And this is actually quite influential. There are a number of American composers who are already following suit in the 1890s and kept going right up until uh, the time that uh, Bloch began to work on his America. Um, a very interesting phenomenon, in some ways a very naive notion. Um, I don't know if Dvorak had much of an idea of the differences in musical traditions among different tribes, that Seminole music has nothing to do with Chinook music or Algonquin music. These are completely different traditions, different instruments, different vocalities, different rituals, and so on. Um, to him, it was all just this one undifferentiated thing of American music. And then another maybe criticism that could be made uh, is, has more bearing on some of what Bloch was up to, because some of these tribes are straddling the border between the United States and Canada, uh, or between the United States and Mexico. So if the idea is to show what a patriotic American you are by incorporating uh, Native American musical traditions, and yet at the same time you're making use of Chippewa or Ojibwa music, well, that's really no more American than Canadian. That is, it's not uh, particular to the United States. Um, so there are these sort of fundamental conceptual difficulties with the whole enterprise. Um, I do think that there's a strong case to be made that the principal reason why he is drawing on these traditions is that he is American or has become American, has adopted America as his homeland and has strong feelings for it and uh, wants to show that, wants to put that on display in musical terms by drawing on these uh, conditions. So I guess uh, this is 
um, leading up to a, a question, and the main question had to do with this fascinating Solomon Bibo uh, person that you've spoken about. Have I understood correctly that there is no specific documentation no, of contact between these people? I, I'm just saying it's conjecture. I don't have any uh, any documentation other than he did. He he is he did um, he was part of membership in Temple Emmanuel in 1928 to 1934. I said, and um, he did live in, and he also was uh, um, um, part of the, the. He was doing the the trading post in 1924. So those things did happen, but I I don't. I, it's, but the, the, see, the thing is that. Um, just because it's not documented doesn't mean that it, it may or may not have happened. That's all I'm saying. Um, because uh, I, I think I explained that once in my, in my, in my treatise about with uh, Dr. Brown or about the lay princesses that she talks about. And she gave this really, because she's talked about, and um, she really, let me get that part, hold on here. That's Jewish trader part. Oh yeah. She talked about this lay princesses. Um, here we go. And I'll read here what this says. Um, she says a really good example of something like this was uh, it's a a a um, a, uh, um, a, a uh, article called Le, the princesses, and it came out in Paris Review. And I have it, and it's fascinating because in the late 1720s, there were a couple of Indian guys, actually Choctaw guys, who had been captured in war by a French guy who sold them to a British guy, a ship captain. The Indian guys were all tattooed up in fascinating ways. And the guy, the ship captain, took them on tour all over Europe. He had them in London for a while, and what he will do Sorry. And what we would do, he would stay in a bar or, you know, an inn, and then people will come and pay and go into a room. And the Indians would uh, take off their clothes off so they could see, you know, all the tattoos and everything. And they thought it was all fascinating. So finally, they end up in Leipzig. And a really weird thing happened. These two Indian men who were sneaking in and out start going to a local Lutheran church. And you know what, what, what that was? Yeah. And within a few months, they have converted. Uh, they have been baptized and converted to Lutherism, in which case the elector, um, the elector down there, it was elector, I cannot remember his name. I think it was Philip Augustus converted the, to Catholicism so he could be the king of Poland. And he was so upset by this that, that he brought he bought the Indians and gave them to, as a gift to Catherine the Great, and they disappeared from history. But I was thinking, why would these co guys convert to Lutheranism? What the hell was going on that they encountered that all these years of being in Europe converted to Lutheranism? So that that was that was really where I came to where I'm you know you know segueing to to possibly with Bloch. It doesn't. I'm not saying that it that we have documentation, but just because. <laughs> He was in certain places at certain times. There is a possibility, like for example, I mean, we're talking about um, the uh, Temple Emmanuel, which is mostly German Jews. I mean, there there's going to be mostly Ashkenazis. Um, why, why uh, would he just have this big spoke thing? Okay, I'm going to do Native American right now. And it's past the the time of when, when you know, as you were talking about those com the composers, that happened in the early 1900s. We're we're talking about, if I call, right after the Dawes Act and kind of like up to the 1920s. I have to look it up again, but uh, if I recall, that was what it is. So so what made him want to make something like this, where he's saying he's he's saying undoubtedly Native American uh, Native American uh, American Indian um, character melodies and such. So sure. that was my thought. I see. Well, for the record, Josh, um, if it's conjecture, I think it's very strong conjecture and very persuasive conjecture. I do think it's quite possible, maybe bordering on likely, that there was some sort of contact or that Bloch certainly knew about this person. And uh, and you're right, this is also a helpful hypothesis that you know accounts for certain things that are otherwise uh, kind of mysterious. And this other thing about the Choctaws touring Europe. So in addition to a Bloch-Solomon-Bivo connection, <laughs> the idea that 
that these Choctaw Indians might have heard music by Johann Sebastian Bach in Leipzig in the 1720s. Um, more mind-blowing ideas for me to... I know, it's, it's so, that was project. a mind-blowing uh, thing when she told me that. I was like, wow, that's so neat. I mean, they're going all over Europe, and all of a sudden they go to Leipzig, and then they convert to Lutherism. Well, just because they went to this church? I mean, you can't tell me that Bach had some sort of influence them maybe 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 not to convert to to lutheranism so it's kind of interesting story so so i am sure that there are uh questions for josh and um not sure if the best way to do this you can try to raise your hands physically and i can see that and uh maybe josh you're also able to field your own questions so if you do have a question raise your hand Myron Silverstein. So maybe half question, half comment. You know, one of the things that struck me most about the melodic materials uh, that uh, that are within the, the the violin concerto that have have Native American origin is how similar they are to some materials that exist uh, independently of of Native American origin in, in Bloch's work. You know, the uh, uh, descending triplet motif um uh da, da 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 that's that's very very prominent in the first violin sonata uh you know which was written uh, quite a bit before this um and uh you know the uh ascending seconds da 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 da, da, mm -hmm. da that's throughout you know voice in the wilderness slash visions and prophecies um, and and so it's 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 curious to me um the extent to which bloch uh, sort of assimilates these external materials and uh you know find something within them that is is kind of indelibly blah i mean if 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 you were not to know that there's native american origin in this uh you would just listen to the violin concerto and 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 think that's that's something that sounds you know very much like a work by by ernest bloch in a way that when you listen to say you know mcdowell's uh character pieces of, of native american material it, it it does not really sound you know like mcdowell as much as it sounds like a a, a native american homage um so i'm i guess i'm i'm sort of curious about uh your thoughts about bloch's usage of the materials of of you know how how he processed them uh during the course of of, of this work well uh well mcdowell is a little different but um the the thing that I was really um, impressed with is is that um, when we're looking at just even the America, he's really trying to find authentic themes. I mean, I mean that is really rare. I mean, this he knew he knew about Francis Densmore. He knew that this person was. I mean, she was going all to the fifties, uh, writing these things all over the uh, United States uh, of, of of like trying to assimilate all these these melodies, and he knew about it. And so um, I think that's really for myself as, as, as you, know, uh, you know, doing research, I was like, I was amazed that, that somebody that, that I only knew as, as a person who, who, you know, is really known for like the Black Shlomo, the Black Nigun, you know, th these Judaic ones can write his violin concerto, not Judaic wise or something that, that comes from that, but really Native American. I mean, that that's really was mind blowing for me. I mean, what what really made him, you know, get so inspired? I mean, and I and I I think since he's, you know, he's probably going from the same sources as the American. I don't think he's going to go from other sources and trying to 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 sort. That'd be a lot of work. Um, but he's going based on his experiences. There's no doubt. So yeah, that's why I think that that makes his his piece so original for for me as a as a as a person because um, as you know, Dvorak he never really. Yes, I I, I, I I read a little bit about it, but it, 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 he was looking more for the Americana thing, not really all these other things. He's just kind of assimilating everything together. Um, um, but um, because he's, he's based on the movement that was happening at the time, and he was trying to you know, spur that as, 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 uh, um, as Jesse was talking about. But Block was going, I think, a little bit different in my, and I just, I just think, it was really cool. And now he could have had the Indian craze. The Indian craze was happening in the 20s and 30s, which means that um, that there was a lot of height of, of, of seeing these powwows happening outside. Powwows usually never were, um, or more private. They weren't really public. And so 
um, that would be something that would really catch his mind. Of course, uh, his his his. I don't, if I recall, uh, Lucian can tell me, but uh, I don't think that uh, um, uh, Block knew about the relationship with Charlie Potts. I forgot that one. I have to look in my notes, but uh, um, I think that was also very interesting about that as well. You know, you know, hanging around with the Ojibwe tribe uh, leader. So. And he also was really big on, on environment, you know, he was a, you know, he's an environmentalist. He was a big guy who likes to go out and, and pick agates in, in, in Oregon. He liked, he was a person who, who, who's like Strauss, who likes to go, you know, hiking in the, in the mountains, you know, I mean, I could see that uh, knowing that, uh, that the Native Americans are the caretakers of the earth. I think he would really um, kind of be, um, you know, leaning to that versus to what was happening with the, with the uh, capitalism. So, yeah. You gotta unmute. Or I'll unmute. I got it. Uh, thank you. Good. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, so first of all, with Charlie Potts, she had Suzanne liked him in early on in twenty four, but she didn't have an affair with him until nineteen thirty one. Until nineteen thirty one. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what year years Charlie was the um, chief because I don't believe he was a chief in twenty four. Um, and okay. I'm not sure he was a chief in 31. Maybe he was a chief later. Um, that also might um, answer some question there. But um, yeah, I did have a question though. Yes. You, did you listen to any of the other um, pieces that were written for the America competition? No, I did not. I was just curious if any of the other ones might have had brought in any Indian um, sounds hmm. that's a, that's a good question um i, I don't uh, i didn't you know the funny thing is kushner didn't put that in his in his mark he's always going right to uh talking about okay this was this was this was the uh the um uh, the announcement this is what he did gave the chronological i mean it was in that um my resource on that was from the, the Ewa University. Ironically, I have two friends who who go there, so he, they they uh, scanned it and sent it to me, which was really nice. Um, yeah. Interesting. Are there other other comments or questions, Alex? Thank you. You are muted, I think. I'm mute. Oops. So, Alex, you're muted. Yeah. We cannot hear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, want to interrupt because I think Michael Friedlander wanted to ask Excellent. a question. I'll come after. No, I can come after you. It's fine. No problem. <laughs> okay. That, thanks ever so much, Josh. Um, and um, that was very, very similar. And it raised a huge number of really interesting and quite controversial issues here. Uh, and I'm very pleased you've done that very openly and honestly. Um, just just a couple of things first i might come back a little bit later on but i'd just like to say that uh, we ought to understand that bloch was a very accomplished ethnomusicologist before ethnomusicology was the big big deal that it is now um in the early days before around 1950 it wasn't ethnomusicology at all it was called comparative musicology as we know and it functioned primarily in america and in germany but ernest bloch knew a huge amount of traditional music, not only folk music, but also traditional music um, from all over Europe and all over Asia as well. And he did his own transcriptions. And he used these for his lectures in the Geneva Conservatoire in the 1910s um, uh, onwards before he went to America in 1916. So he was very um, familiar with the idea of music that originated outside what you might call the Western classical mainstream. Um, and, and so therefore the music that he would have heard in America, he would have been naturally very stimulated by lots of different kinds of um, music, as indeed in the American Symphony, it shows you know, the, the, the influences of all sorts of um, backgrounds, the incoming uh, of different nationalities coming into the USA at different times, starting in 1656 and then going on right the way through until 1926 or so when the, the composition was complete. Um, so Bloch already had a predisposition to being interested in the musics of other cultures. Now the whole question 
of what you do with the music of other cultures when you incorporate it into Western classical music, which is what's happening here, is a very controversial issue. And there are a lot of ethnomusicologists who are troubled by it. And there are all sorts of ethics committees in all sorts of universities all over the place. And they all say, you know, how correct is it to use this music? Um, which comes from people who sing it naturally and as part of their everyday life and incorporated into our compositions which are then published and then we get paid for them. <laughs> now th th this, this, is a, a, this is a subject that is very much on the minds of ethnomusicologists. I'm not making a comment about it, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing or whatever, I'm just saying that that's what's happening and people are worried about it. Um, so it seems to me perhaps that if Dvorak, for example, is doing research in the Czech lands, Czechoslovakia as it used to be called, um, in a sense he is utilizing the music of the culture in which he was himself born. And then he went to America, we know he used um, a native black music and native American music as well. Um, uh, and, but, but if people come to America and then use the music of the native Americans, which is a different culture, um, very much from the European culture, cultures from which most immigrants came, um, then there is a question about what is the motive? Is the motive because they are completely attracted to the music, as in the case of Bloch, because he loved all this kind of thing, or are there other motives going on? And I think these questions really need to be asked um, of, of all Western composers who use musical material from cultures that are other than their own. And, you know, what happens then to the music that they compose uh, <clears throat> consequently. So um, I just thought I'd throw that out because um, there is this debate going on. And I think we ought to put it, you know, on the record, even if we don't necessarily need, need to make a comment. I just want to say one other thing, and that is about the Jewish and the non-Jewish and the Native American and et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> it again is a problem because in 1938, Bloch composed the Violin Concerto after having worked on it for a long time, um, as you say, from 1930 onwards. Um, and he said, as you quoted, absolutely, uh, he said, in it, there is no Jewish inspiration. Fine. Okay. Two years earlier, he composed Voice in the Wilderness, which he included among his Jewish works, according to his own definition. Now, if you listen to those two pieces together, um, Voice in the Wilderness for cello and orchestra, violin concerto, obviously violin and orchestra, um, and listen to them stylistically, they are very close. They're very similar. Take the cadenza of the violin concerto at the end of the last of the first movement and take the cadenza that comes <clears throat> between the fifth and sixth um, movements of the voice in the wilderness. And it would be very hard to draw a dividing line stylistically between the two. So therefore, again, as we've mentioned before, it's very interesting to see what motivated Bloch to say that one thing is Jewish and the other thing isn't, when in fact, stylistically, they're very, very similar. Um, and it's not only a question of quoting traditional tunes, it's a question of the whole process of composition, which I think is a very important factor in determining the Bloch style, which, as I think everybody would agree, is very recognizable, very distinctive. One only needs to hear a few bars of something, you say, that's Bloch. Sorry, I lost you all there. I, for some reason, I lost power for a second. <laughs> and so, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's it's like there's there's a um, there's no distinguishingness between them because he's using it from other places. But maybe you know if he's using um, you know Densmore works as as a possible um, uh, reference for for the America, he's gonna use some of those references for the violin control, even though, it, as you say, as as we we were talking about, it, it could have leaked into other places, to other 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 pieces that he wrote. Yes, but that's my thought. Thank you, uh, Josh. Josh. Yes. Oh, uh, his interest in ethnomusicology 
would tie right in with Solomon Bebo singing songs in the shul. You might elaborate a, a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'm the trying to find my, 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 because let me just, yeah. no, no, let me just finish. Uh, he was sitting there with his children uh, in a, a shul, which was predominantly German Jewish, uh, reformed. And he was uh, probably at one point or another humming these tunes. And there are recordings of these of him humming these tunes, I think, or singing these tunes. But I wonder right. if there's any connection between the music he was singing in the shul and anything that you can find in his pieces. That might be a connection to Bebo. It's hard to tell. Okay, I, mean, I just, I, just I, going I feel like it just sounded very focal focused. I come I can find I can share it for everybody in a second here. Hold on. I have another question too. Okay, so yeah. Josh will uh, call something up uh, and then uh, Lucien and then Edison. Is that a good order to follow? Okay, thanks. No, you could you could get the question. I'm still looking for it. I I had it and it, it fell out. Okay. Did, you, did did Bebo have his papers? Are they held anywhere? Because if Bebo. he and Block, if he and Block were were friends, if they met more than once or had a relationship, Block would have written him. For and sure. He did not. So and there's he did his not. papers aren't or he, there's no you've seen his papers or there is no papers kept. Uh, I looked at the letters. I couldn't find for the letters that I find. I, I couldn't find anything in the papers. I, I did not know. I didn't. I didn't see anything so far. But it was. It's a conjecture that I have. That's all. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense because I mean, if you're, if I mean, I can. I cannot imagine a person who who goes to a uh, um, to a temple Emmanuel and ha going in with an Akama Pueblo woman, a fully blooded Akama Pueblo woman, that would really be, wow. I remember that from going to San, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Maybe that was inspiration. I don't know, but that that it's something to think about. I'm trying to get this thing here. Yeah. I'm like, I, I agree. The idea of trying to uh, to trace whatever archive now conserves the Solomon Bebo papers would be a, a wonderful way to see what documentary evidence might surface to uh, in support of this very strong uh, conjecture. Um, while you're still searching, Joshua, maybe you can go on to Edison Fairbisk. Yes. Edison, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Josh. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Block says he was profoundly grateful to Yehud Menuhin that uh, had resuscitated the violin concerto in December of '57 in New York after al al almost 20 years that the concert was forgotten. Uh, well, and I am wondering the reasons for that because it's that's a great because... concert mm -hmm. to be. There's a reason for that. Uh, the reason is because uh, he wanted to, because it was dedicated to Joseph Zagetti, and he felt that uh, he didn't want to, um, that work was his. That's what he felt. That's what he wrote in his- well, in, Only in, this in, reason, but is uh, my professor uh, think and said for me is the is very difficult uh, for play and, and the play with orchestra because the violinist is, is um, is the, not not play is uh, forging. It yeah, be... it's out of print. I mean, I have it it's right good. here. It, it's out of print. This this thing I had to find on on Amazon, and, and it was uh, it's by Boozy and Hawks. So there there is there is a there is a print of it. I also found this in the University of Washington in Seattle. So they they in the in their music school. So there they are. It are prints of this this violin material. It just never. Um, it's out of print. That's why I want. That's why I wanted to write my 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 treatise dissertation on this because I thought I mean, let's. I want to get it back into print. I want this thing to be played more. I was very happy uh, when um, uh, EB two asked me to come down for uh, the Portland, Oregon one uh, to to listen to um, uh, the premiere of it with the Oregon Symphony. That was really cool. Seeing the actually live performance of 
of the Ernest Block Bilingual Children I've never seen before. Okay. Great. Thank you. Try to find this. Other comments or questions for Joshua? Yes, Alex, please. Thank you. Sorry. Only if nobody else wants to speak at this moment. Um, <clears throat> do we know what was the actual um, situation in which Bloch listened to the music of the Native Americans whom he was visiting? How, how, what, what, what happened? Did he meet with them in a social way and that they would start singing for him and then he would register the melodies in his mind? Um, or did he have a notebook where he wrote the tunes down? Or I, I presume that he probably wouldn't have done anything perhaps as intrusive as take a tape recorder along with him or some such equivalent um, machine that might have existed at the time, a wax cylinder machine. Um, how did he do it? You see, because as I mentioned, uh, Ernest Bloch was really a very, very early um, ethnomusicologist, far ahead of his time. And I think he was a great deal more sensitive than many ethnomusicologists um, who, and, and I've read quite a bit about, you know, how ethnomusicologists went into what they called the field in order to get recordings from what they called the native musicians, wherever it was in the world. And sometimes they did it in a very unsubtle way. And so therefore the people who were singing for them would sing to them what they felt the um, ethnomusicologists wanted to hear rather than what they would normally do when they were not being recorded. And so that's why I'm wondering really what, what were the um, sources and what kind of sources did Bloch have for the music that um, he would have perhaps collected um, for possible use in later compositions. And I mean, I, the same thing applies to the Chinese music that he heard in Chinatown in San Francisco, which some of which he then used in a very much adapted way in the Evocation Suite of 1937. All of this was happening around about the same time. It's interesting, sort of like late 1930s. It's interesting that this should have been quite a, um, a time in Bloch's life where he was particularly interested in utilizing these kinds of materials. So this, that was my question about how, how, he got, how he got the material. So one thing that I know for sure, because I have a few of them, is that Bloch always had a little, um, tablet in his pocket always With and so music, a music tablet right a music tab that had the lines so you know he would whether he was hiking or you know in the city streets or whatever he, he if a note something came to him he could he could write it down i would assume that the photographs where he's there and there's a band well we use the word band there's a group of indians that are in there with their musical instruments and their voice and their drum um that he probably listened on the streets, maybe in Santa Fe. Um, I would assume that when he was visiting the Ojibwa, that, that they would have had music for sure. And, you know, along the ethnomusicology, um, I know that my grandmother wrote a lot. She would go into a, a five and dime and she would come across a, a record, a Javanese record. And she would be so excited to give it to her father because it was something she hadn't seen or maybe he hadn't heard it. So I think all the kids probably you know, we're always on the lookout as well to find something unusual for him to listen to. And, you know, as a musician, you know, you hear music, it, it stays with you. So when something comes to you, you might have taken a little something from here or there. And, and they had no way to record anything in the early 30s. He had a wire recorder done of his lectures at Cal in the 50s, but in the 30s. He Nothing. certainly didn't have any way to travel with anything. There was no way to record anything except his notebooks. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. If so, I could uh, interject a, a question here. Um, do we really know for a fact that this was done by directly listening, uh, either to a live musical performance or uh, listening to recordings? Um, that photograph, Joshua, that you showed of uh, Frances Desmond, very interesting photograph of her making a recording. 
Mm -hmm. um, I actually wasn't sure that she had done that sort of thing. What I knew her for was producing this uh, large series of volumes on Native American music, each volume devoted to a particular tribe, and uh, made lots of transcriptions, which she published, but also had lots of descriptions of their lives and the harvest rituals and the religious rituals and so on. I'm wondering, um, I, since I know nothing about the private library of Ernest Bloch, did he have any of these volumes? Is it possible that he was getting some of these uh, sources from what he found uh, published? rather than actually listening to them well the publishment of the uh, of, uh let me see if I could, the publishment of the chippewa came in the, the teens i believe so that that would be early hold on i think i wrote that i think i put that down hold on was i think it was in my my powerpoint let me see if i can find my powerpoint again i found my 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 uh, navajo song of the navajo by bebo if you want to hear something crazy but i would i would love to hear something crazy all right let's let's listen to this and you you this is a, this is a something. Uh, I was they were so nice to, when I was asking for these from the from the uh, Loomis Library. Um, they they digitalized the five the five of uh, Solomon Bebo. Listen to this and you tell me if this sounds Native American. <laughs> kind of worn out but you can hear it doesn't sound anything like native american in my opinion it sounds like some 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 yiddish folklore or judaic uh folklore stuff that's why i thought it was very interesting uh, knowing about solomon Bebo. yes yes but <laughs> the whole point is that it was sung in a very Hasidic sort of way with all the oi 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 and all that um which which is very typically eastern european voice production and the performance practice was very much Jewish. But how would it have sounded if somebody from the um, particular Native American culture were to have sung that very, very same song? You know, yeah, you could sing happy birthday to you yeah, and you can make it, it sound it, Chinese it was... or you can make it sound Indian or you can make it sound Jewish. It depends on how you sing it. So if yeah. there's voice production and performance practice, as well as the material itself, which can make it sound completely different. So it's very possible that that was a Native American melody, but it didn't sound it. Song of the Navajo song. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that, that doesn't sound like it to me. <laughs> That's the funny part. I mean, because I, when I listen to the, to the um, because there's so many microtonal things that you hear for, with Native American stuff, they're not really, set with melodic this felt very melodic to me when i'm hearing with bebo versus when you hear um uh, it's really hard to really distinguish what is tone uh, the, the tones that they're using the pitches they're using in, in uh in tribal melodies because it's all oral tradition so it, it you know it's a it just sounds differently but I what, I what she was showing me uh with the wax recordings that um that i heard from uh 19 was it 19 in the teens, I believe she had. It was very interesting, Dr. Browner. So, great. Um, what was the other thing I wanted? Oh yeah, I'll show you the the uh, the amount of. Uh... I have a question. When there is a second. Here we go. All right. So this was the Microsoft. Oh, this is the PowerPoint. As you can see, from 1910 all the way to 1957, so there's a lot, a long range of of of, of books. And the Mendana Dasa is with 1923, which is right before he wrote the America. Hmm. 
great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Frank, you had a question. I was just curious, is there is there in fact any musical instrument that is specifically identified with Native American? Uh, there's a cedar, there's a cedar flute uh, that uses uh, pentatonic. That's the only one I, I mean, I don't know all the other ones, obviously the drums, but the cedar flute is uh, where they, they cut out something and then they, they, they put holes in each, obviously the, the holes will be uh, assigned in a certain way and then they would have certain pitches. Um, that's the only one I know of. I mean, I'm not an, I'm not a, a, an ex expert to really give it, but that's the one she gave as a, as a, as a description when we had our interview. Other questions, other comments for Joshua? And if not, perhaps I can uh, hand things over again to uh, Geraldine, who uh, may wish to say a few words to conclude this meeting. Thanks, uh, Jesse. This has been the most illuminating and really thought-provoking presentation, Joshua. Thank you so much. And obviously has elicited some uh, queries and eyebrow raising and uh, clapping all at the same time. So uh, it's wonderful to see Bloch being uh, embraced in such strong ways by a younger generation. So that's really wonderful. So um, thank you. Thank you, Jesse, for finding Joshua and the other young students and bringing them to this table, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Do you want to say what's coming next month? Um, next month, I believe I myself am on the docket. You are, you are, yes. So just tell us a little bit about that. This will be a presentation on the reception of the music of Ernest Bloch in fascist Italy, culminating in the uh, world premiere of the sacred service. That, that sounds very fascinating and we look forward to that and we know that Alex Knapp will be talking some stage, Malcolm Singer will be talking about um, the sacred service in various places and about Bloch and Menuhin. So we have a lot to look forward to. So I think what we can do is perhaps stop the recording and then if people want to chat, um, we can keep the room open a little while.